Oh yes, welcome again to uh, mm -hmm. another of our great lectures. This is the third lecture in ACE 812813. Uh, we're going to have a very exciting time with uh, Professor Bill Kyle uh, all the way in um, in the U.S. Uh, I'll, I'll do a brief introduction of him and then I will yield to uh, Bill to interact with us for, let's see now, yes, for 40 minutes and then we'll have question and answer so that by, uh, by a little bit after 12 noon, uh, we'll draw the session to a uh, close. Okay. So, who is uh, Professor Bill Kyle? Uh, that's what I want to uh, let me see now. Yes, if you can see my screen. Bill Kyle is the E. Desmond Lee Family Professor of Science Education at the University of Missouri St. Louis in, U in the U.S. Uh, Bill served as editor of the Journal of Research in Science Teaching, Easily, the number one journal in science education in the world. He served as editor between January 1994 and May 1999. And he was the executive secretary, the executive director. He was the boss of all of us, all the science educators all over the world, under the umbrella of the National Association of Research and Science Teaching, NAST. From uh, April of 07 to 31st of December 2018, apparently the longest serving of uh, our executive directors. He has collaborated with science educators, <coughs> universities, and communities in Sub Saharan Africa for over 20 years. Uh, is uh, presently raising the consciousness of science educators with respect to their silence. Oh, this is important. Their silence on addressing global challenges facing humanity and the need to expand our views of science education to address sustainable development, empowerment, and social infrastructure. It's my pleasure, Bill, to invite you uh, to give your lecture. Over to you. Thank you very much, Peter, and a good morning to all of you. Fortunately for me, it's five in the morning, and for you, it's a little after 11, so I can still say good morning to everybody. <laughs> so, uh, Peter and I have known each other for many, many years. I promised just the other day in our meeting that I would not reveal the exact number. Uh, we were both teenagers at the time, right? Oh, yes, we were, yeah. But anyhow, uh, I want to share the screen with you. And uh, do a PowerPoint that should be on the screen, but I don't see it. Hang on a second. Yeah, no problem. 19 pandemic that's uh, begun about three months ago, sweeping across the world. And I think it offers a case study in a global crisis management notion. And for me, yeah, sorry, Bill, we can't see the presentation yet. We can only see your five, uh, Windows uh, the Explorer. Uh, we can see, yeah, that, uh, no, not here. Yeah, that's it. We can see it now. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, very clear. So the title for me addresses a current issue, obviously over the course of the past three months, and it raises questions for me with respect to how are we going to address the climate emergency in the future. So I only have two cartoons throughout the presentation. But my sense is that the individuals who live on small island developing states hope that this is not the future for them. And so you'll see the one person up on the island exclaiming that the good news is that all of the plastic rubbish produced by the industry as heating the planet and raising the sea levels is actually starting to form floating islands. Wow. Yet if you look below, 
you'll see that that individual's home is several meters below the wall. And so one of the things that I'd like to bring to our attention is that in January of 2020, so a mere three months ago, a group of scientists wrote an article that was signed by over 11,000 scientists. The 11,000 scientists came from 153 countries and they offered the following unequivocal declaration that scientists from their perspective have a moral obligation to clearly warn humanity of any catastrophic threat to the human population. They indicated that there's vital signs that are designed to be useful to the public, to policymakers, the business community, and those working to implement the Paris Climate Agreement and other global initiatives. So in every one of my slides where I cite a source, I have the, the source, in most cases, the hot link. And Peter, you're more than willing to share the entire presentation with the entire class and others. So personally, I find it surprising. And just a moment ago, you were talking about curriculum and uh, instruction in universities and the preparation of individuals. So I find it surprising that most or much of the school-based literature regarding climate change focuses exclusively upon environmental degradation and upon biodiversity. And there's no doubt that those are important factors associated with climate change. But in my way of thinking, it fails to recognize the significant impact that climate change has upon human health, agriculture, food stability, the global spread of infectious diseases. And this comes from a forthcoming article that's going to be appearing in a new journal. Uh, it's a new international journal in science education based out of Portugal with uh, editors that are also in Brazil. So four to five years ago, the World Health Organization was compiling issues related to health and the impacts of climate change upon health. And one of the factors that I want to bring to your attention is that their estimate is that between the years 2030 and 2050, that 250,000 deaths annually will likely occur as a result of climate change related health issues. This is a fact that nobody talks about. And I wonder why. For those of us in science education, when we say that we're trying to ensure that the youth of today have the skills and competencies to lead in the future, these are among some of the challenges that they'll be confronted as active adults and as citizens. So all of the health-related issues are expected to be with respect to heat exposure for elderly, cardiovascular system issues, respiratory systems, increase in uh, diseases that people will be incurring as a result of raising temperatures across the globe. And their estimate of 250 deaths per year is what they refer to as a conservative. This is the publication that that uh, source of information comes from. This is, a, I, I think, a nice graphic of the health outcomes that could be affected by climate change issues. And so I leave this for you as a source of information. It comes from the New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 2019. So one of the things that I think is that there's many questions with respect to the ultimate reach of the pandemic that we don't yet know. And yet we do know several factors already. That is the fact that it's having an impact upon citizens, that it's having an impact upon the global economy, that it's having an impact upon the environment. And the behavioral changes are pretty clear. People as ourselves, are no longer at our offices or workplaces. We're working from our homes right now. I've never spent so much time on Zoom as I have in the past two weeks, and I'm sure you haven't as, as well. Uh, so there are all of these factors that are impacting our daily lives. 
And the interesting thing is that all of these factors, which contribute to global, to, to the global climate issue, are observable from space. So I encourage you to visit the sites that I've mentioned. And you can see that throughout the globe, that levels of pollutants and GHGs have decreased substantially. And ultimately, the question for me as science educators is, when the pandemic is over, will we, will we return to our daily lives without ever paying any attention to the climate? Or will we begin to invest in the environment in ways that are absolutely essential for the survival of the planet? Then there's other things that are not observable from space associated with the pandemic. And that's the fact that the virus highlights social, structural inequalities that are not visible from space, but that are felt in the daily lived experiences of individuals across the globe, people who live in poverty, uh, who are much more severely impacted as a result of the pandemic than are those who have access to wealth. And the fact of the matter is that when we're talking about the 250 potential thousand deaths every year related to climate change, those individuals are also ones who predominantly live in high stress poverty type environments. And so the issue for both of the global the pandemic and the climate emergency the correlations are that the populations most at risk for both are individuals who reside in high poverty environments. So the data that I'm sharing with you here is as of about 9.45, my local time last night. And the question that I just raised for you a second ago is that when the present crisis is over, will we invest as heavily in the environment as we're presently addressing in the global pandemic. That for me is the pivoting that I'm talking about in the title and as we continue with the rest of the presentation. So I know that Peter shared an article with you that appeared in a journal in January, uh, which is also a brand new journal in science education. And in there I maintain the fact that education is often disassociated from the contextual realities of life. When people go to school, almost regardless of where they go to, to school in the, nation, in the nation, in the US, or throughout the world, there's little correlation between what happens in school and what happens in students' daily lives. And typically, the education discourse is oriented towards what I refer to as the goals, the aspirations, the desires, and the needs of the millions. And you might say, what does that mean? Well, when we have 7.4 billion people on the planet, well, it means that the, the vast majority of educational discourse is oriented towards a very small percentage of the global population. So we're talking that it's oriented towards millions of people as opposed to the billions that reside on the planet. I want to talk about the billions and the kinds of things that we ought to be doing as educators and science educators to ensure that individuals, populations, are empowered and able to work on social transformation issues within their local communities that have not only local impacts, but also global impacts as well. My perspective is that access to knowledge is access to power. And when I work in communities, uh, a little bio said over 20 years, I calculated it last night. It's, it's actually over 30 years, Peter. Uh, <laughs> where I've been working since, uh, again, I won't reveal the date, but back in the late 80s when, when I first made my trip to, to MINA. Yeah, to MINA, yes. When I believe Peter was the president of STAN, is that correct? No, I was Secretary General. Secretary General, yes. yes. So my point here is that all too often educators are complicit in failing to afford the poorest of the poor access to education, knowledge, opportunities to succeed, and ensure that they have a life satisfaction and, and well-being. I also think that it's imperative that when we're talking about the billions of people on the planet, that we talk about the number 1.8 billion. Because presently, there are 1.8 billion youth 
on the planet. So if you calculate that, that's about 20% of the total population. So a couple of sources that I'd like you to go to at your leisure. We're not going to spend time here. Paul Collier authored this book, The Bottom Billion. And in here, in the first minute and 22 seconds, what he talks about, which I think is imperative in the conversation that we're having, is the alliance of compassion and the enlightened self-interest and the bringing together of those two issues in the context of addressing uh, why the poorest countries on the planet are failing and what can be done about it. Another book that I'd like you to uh, at least watch the trailer to a movie is called The End of Poverty. Jeffrey Sachs is a leading world economist and yet most of his work is with respect to sustainable development. So among his early books was The End of Poverty. In a second, we're going to look at another book that he's authored recently that I happen to use in my elementary school and middle school science methods class that I teach, which is a Wednesday night class. It's called The Age of Sustainable Development. And we're going to look at a clip from there in a second. But in this book, he talks about the economic possibilities for our time. And for those of you who are music lover, lovers, you'll notice that the forward is by Bono. Uh, most people don't associate with him as being on the front cover as having written the forward to books or economic books and or sustainable development books. Uh, but he is of U2 fame. So we've already said the fact that uh, there's 7.4 billion people on the planet. 75 million people are at it annually. And much of the demographic change between now and the year 2050 with respect to the increase in population is occurring in least developed regions. And so if we look at population issues, uh, when we think in terms of developed nations, those populations have leveled off and or are decreasing. And the increase in population is with respect to individuals residing in high poverty nations and states. And that's part of the structural inequality that I was talking about a few slides ago. So for example, 70% of Africa's population is under the age of 30. And yet, as science educators, we say, that one of our roles, among our roles and responsibilities, is to address the needs of youth. 25% are youth between the ages of 15 and 24. And so the potentiality of youth transforming the future is real. We've oftentimes talked about the fact that the future is youth, and yet presently the youth that we're talking about have to be concurrently not only going to school, but transforming the planet at the same time. 87% of the global youth population resides in developing countries. Clearly, they face challenges that are brought upon by limited access to resources, nutrition, healthcare, education, employment, economic opportunities. And yet, in spite of the reality of students' daily lives, Many initiatives have been undertaken for which the goals have not been met. So some of you might be familiar with the Education for All goals that were not met by the year 2015. Many of you are probably familiar with the Millennium Development Goals, which were similarly not met by the year 2015. And so the contextual reality is that science educators in particular ought to be addressing these issues. And that's one of the things when I interact and work, and work with many people in developing countries, uh, the goal is to bring about social transformation in local communities. So here's a publication for you, just simply to, uh, to look at. That's six years old. And yet, six years ago, they're talking about the power of the 1.8 billion youth on the planet and the opportunities to transform the future in terms of careers and, and so on. So my assertion is that youth on the planet should not be disenfranchised 
due to poor political leadership. And what I see around the globe, and for those of you kind of critiquing the United States these days, uh, it, it, it applies particularly to the United States, uh, is that we have examples of poor leadership in many countries. We have the ability to interact collegially internationally, which is how addressing issues related to the pandemic that we're presently facing, future pandemics or global climate emergency is going to have to occur. So one of the publications that's cited later on in a list of references that I have, they highlight the ways in which youth are challenging power relationships and political interests to bring about climate resistance futures. So I mentioned the fact that youth should not be disenfranchised as a result of poor political leadership. So here's two examples. Uh, for decades, public health officials have been warning with respect to the possibility of future pandemics. And yet nations have been unprepared. So we ask questions such as, why were nations unprepared? How did they fall behind over numerous years of warnings to not be able to address the issue? And I simply turn that around by saying, scientists have been issuing warnings for over a century. And politicians and the public haven't paid attention to those warnings either. So my question is, how can we begin to reinvest in education in ways in which students, in collaboration with their local communities, national communities, begin to realize that these warnings that have been issued for decades and centuries are indeed real, that it affects people's daily lives, and that it has an impact upon not only each and every individual, but it has an impact upon the global environment as well. So my assertion is that science educators ought to be at the forefront of ensuring that the education discourse is oriented towards the goals, the aspirations, the desires of the 1.8 billion youth on the planet. And all too often as a result of universalism and standardization, learners experience a science that is completely disconnected from the contextual realities of their living experiences. So I think we need to begin to change that. In 2016, I don't know if any of you we need to reinvest in. I think we need to reinvest in new opportunities for education and skill development, new opportunities for community development and social transformation, new opportunities for equitable and sustainable economic growth. And that economic growth that I'm talking about and that people like Jeffrey Sachs are talking about is not the economic growth engine that has driven the planet for the past 50 years. And so in one of the two new papers that I've cited that will be coming out for me in the end of this month, I actually have a section that deconstructs what I refer to as the, the misuses and abuses of capitalism in the context of the discourse over the course of the past 50 years and the ways in which we have invested in the wrong kinds of technologies which, is, which have created the problems that we're facing today. New opportunities for agricultural productivity, new opportunities for investments in, in renewable energy, and new opportunities to address many of the global challenges confronting citizens. So my question is, where are the voices of science educators in articulating this vision for the future? So I said we'd spend a little bit of time with Jeffrey Sachs' book. Uh, what he does is offer within the context of this book, this complex interaction of economic, social environment, and political systems. Uh, and my question is, because we're critiquing the ways in which science education has traditionally happened almost for 50 years without change. So my question is, where does the standard curriculum offer students such understandings? You might say that that sounds like a rhetorical question. Uh, it's not really. It's a question that elicits response and action. But from my perspective, the answer to the question is that the present curriculum doesn't do that. And those are among the issues that I'm suggesting that we need to change. 
So Sachs asserts that there's five kinds of concerns about the distribution of well-being. So in the book, uh, he deconstructs, and again, he's an, an economist. And I do want to bring to your attention that the entire notion of sustainability actually emanates from economists to begin with. So oftentimes, science educators think that the notion of sustainability is a science concept, uh, when in reality, it's an economics concept. So the first issue that he deconstructs is extreme poverty. The section, second is inequality, social mobility, discrimination, which again I heard discussed towards the tail end of the previous session, and social cohesion. And what he talks about is that when all of these issues are brought together, when people begin to address them concurrently, that we summarize and we talk about these objective, objectives in the context of social inclusion. So for me, the issue is how do we create awareness? How do we ensure that every person on the planet is aware of the global challenges facing humanity? How, are, how do we ensure that every person on the planet is aware of the 17 sustainable development goals? How do we break, bring, begin to bring about transformations in our school system so that we can facilitate social and social empowerment? And how can we facilitate action taking and social transformation? And as I mentioned, the UNESCO program offers some examples, which is why I included that, uh, that hot link in the, in the presentation for you to look at. So for me, one of the important sustainable development issues is this notion of Earth Overshoot Day. And I'm just curious, are there people who are familiar with Earth Overshoot Day? I can't see everybody, Peter, but is anyone raising their thumbs up? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Michael Ahove and a couple of others are raising their hands up, yes. Okay, so I've got a couple of hot links for you. Yes. I don't want to spend much time here, but one of the things that I do want to spend is the fact that uh, this past year, we reached Earth Overshoot Day on July 31st. So I always deconstruct the information here. In 1982, Earth Overshoot Day was November 15th. And part of the deconstruction of economics that I talk about in that one paper that's forthcoming is the fact that while the planet was almost in harmony, nation states were not in harmony. So the globe was in harmony when, in fact, only a handful of countries were consuming 40% or more of the global resources when they only had 5% of the global population. And so the inequities that existed 40 and 50 years ago have exacerbated to the point where we have the global situation that we have today. So the fact of the matter is, but for children born this year, Earth Overshoot Day is going to be before July 1st, by the time that they finish secondary school. In essence, we will be consuming two years worth of resources every year. And that is clearly an unsustainable path. And so ultimately the issue is, how do we begin to take corrective action today? We're confronting a pandemic, but we can look at the satellite imagery and we can see that as a result of our response to the pandemic, the very issues that we're talking about with respect to climate change and pollution, in many cases have cleared substantially. So in another month, do we return to the past or do we begin to move forward? There's 15 global challenges that I've begun to have some of my graduate students in science education work from this framework. So ultimately, when they're working on, on issues related to sustainable development, they're working from the framework of the 15 global challenges facing humanity. But the assertions of this document have been existed from uh, 2009. So these are not new concepts that we're talking about. They're concepts that, in many cases, for over 20 to 50 years, we've known have been issues that we need to begin to infuse in the science education curriculum, and we simply haven't done so. I also 
believe that we should consider the socio-cultural context of the land, being informed by the values of social justice. So these structural inequities that I was talking about earlier are things that as science educators we ought to be and we need to be addressing. Uh, learning theories that emphasize the critical discourses that, that recognize the alienating contradictions experienced in learning science. And that pedagogy ought to be action-oriented, issue-based, participatory, and critically reflective. These are two assertions that I offer. Uh, again, for me, a big piece of the roles and responsibilities of science educators is the fact that we ought to be linking the issues between the environment, the economy, political and social concerns. Uh, these ought to frame the discourses that the youth of today are using with respect to the ways in which they can contribute to society in the future. For me, a big issue is, is both youth and community activism. And I address that in the forthcoming paper that I've talked about as well. So for about 15 years now, these are issues that I've been working on in local communities in developing countries. But they've been questions that I've raised to science educators for the course of the past 15 years. Why is science education not more intrinsically linked to the goals of human rights, democracy, social justice? What are the ways in which science education ought to be connected to issues of sustainable development? And where are the footpaths to and from science education? So when I'm talking about the footpaths, I'm talking about the fact that for all of these years, I would maintain that in many cases, science educators have been silent with respect to the ways in which the science curriculum ought to be transformed to ensure that we're providing students with the skills and competencies to address these issues in the future. And just so Peter knows, I do have a little stopwatch running on the right here that you all can't see, so I am keeping track of time. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about the future. I'm assuming that everybody's familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals. I have a hat to that. And the document from which the Sustainable Development Goals come. But seldom do I see people in science education talking about the ways in which education as a primary means of investing in human resources ought to be transformed to ensure that the students are the active agents in the entire process. Oftentimes when I read the documents, it talks about the kinds of initiatives that, initiatives that, that adults or leaders ought to be undertaking. And oftentimes when I work initially in local communities, they use the language, we're waiting for the government to do whatever it is that the government does. And the fact of the matter is that for 30 to 50 years, in almost every location on the planet, when people wait for the government to do something, it doesn't occur. When people take local action, there is this sense of community development and community building that occurs. And one success leads to another. And those are the kinds of things that I'm talking about when I say that there's a need to bridge the divide and facilitate dialogue between formal and informal education, free choice educators. This comes from the conclusion section of the second article that's coming out in our mission. And it gets us back to the point at the outset of the conversation. So I believe that a lesson that should be learned from both the COVID-19 humanitarian crisis and the global climate emergency is that science is imperative for human survival. We see governments around the world that have basically been in denial of science for the past 30 to 50 years. And yet, as science educators, somehow I would say that oftentimes we're not complicit because we're not politicians, and yet we're complicit because the ways in which we've developed the curriculum 
hasn't enabled students and communities to deconstruct the knowledge that, that, that they need to deconstruct. We haven't orchestrated learning so that it has an impact upon individuals, communities. It hasn't been intergenerational so that people are communicating around the same issues at the same time. And again, one of the things that I, that I like about the resources that I share from UNESCO is that those are clear examples of the ways in which when those things take place, local communities can take action upon local issues that have global significance. I would like you to, I knew we would not have time for a four minute video. Uh, because I see that it's 38 minutes of my 40 right now. But anyhow, I would like you to take the opportunity at your leisure to look at the video that I have, which is a UN humanitarian aid video. Uh, it'll have artists that you'll be familiar with. But I want you to look at the hashtags that run through there, simply because it represents many of the issues that we've talked about in this presentation. And for which I think that as educators, we ought to be reflecting upon with respect to how to bring about changes within science education, but more particularly to be able to meet the needs and the issues that students will be confronting in the future. We can talk about investments. And so in this slide where it simply says, if the climate were a bank, we would already have been saved. So if we think about the ways in which governments are investing right now in the, in the global pandemic, far too many governments are focused upon the economic impact. Where are we seeing governments focusing upon the impact upon the individuals that I was talking about at the outset of this presentation? Where are we seeing governments talk about the social and political structural inequalities that reside in our communities? Far too many of them are concerned, in particular in the US, uh, far too many of them are concerned with the economic impact and the decline in stock markets and the reinvestment that we need to be doing and I realize it's a part of a big part of your economy, but the reinvestments that we ought to be doing with respect to uh, the oil industry, when in fact the renewable sources of energy that we're talking about pretty much demand that we begin to move away from fossil fuels and reinvest in the environment. So in the paper that the first paper that, that I have some references for. There's an article by Pacheco that I cite, and I particularly like it because he addressed, they address, it's a co-author paper, the issue with respect to the fact that uh, conservation has to become the overarching factor with respect to sustainable development. The globe can't continue down the path of the previous 50 years in terms of global economic development. And there's the section that I mentioned that deconstructs some of the issues. So the next several slides are just simply all of the references that are in these two papers. Uh, the yellow ones are highlighted simply because the editor has to uh, correct these all are occurring in the same issue. And so I wanted you to have access to the resources that I've drawn upon over the course of the past two to three months in order to craft these two articles. Thank you so very much, uh, Bill, for that uh, stimulating, very wonderful presentation. Uh, we can't have it any any better from um, from a global scholar, uh, an icon like you. I, I'm delighted that uh, over the last uh, several years, you 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 shifted uh, towards this. This area of, if I like, if you like, activism, you are now making a clarion call to science educators that they have to develop the wisdom and courage to be able to face uh, the future, uh, especially those related to 
uh, sustainable development. Uh, I will open the floor in a minute, uh, but let me make a few comments, if I may, Bill. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, most science educators in my part of the world, that's Nigeria, and maybe the rest of Africa, uh, we have the wisdom, we, we know what to do, and I think we have the courage, but the, there are several context inhibitors. Uh, you have, uh, like I'm the national president of the Nigerian Association for Environmental Education. Now, my members uh, are those who want, who are born in, you know, to do all that you want us to do. Uh, get the curriculum to have all the human rights elements and all that. But the context is inhibitory. The context in terms of uh, pol government policies, in terms of uh, resourcing resourcing of the individual of the institutions uh, we, we have such challenges but we must bash on regardless and what i think is that uh, uh, the, the, the major part of the business should be for the individuals and for the groups you made a statement an assertion that if we wait for government it doesn't happen and that is very true so we must all have to muster uh, whatever resources we can get, also from the private sector, the private sector is quite willing to support, and then uh, take the corrective, start taking the corrective action today. The corrective action will have to uh, be led by the environmental educators, the science educators, and uh, everybody within that uh, community. You, you, you uh, underscored the, the the point of youth and community activism. So we must. You know, hang on, I mean, jump on that bandwagon, you know, mobilize our youth and the community uh, to uh, uh, be part of the agenda of sustainable development, of, uh, of all of those things that you, that, you, that, you, that you mentioned. The last thing I'd like to state is that we're going to watch the video, actually the last two things. We're going to watch the video and uh, give you uh, our feedback on it. So the last one is that while Professor Michael are over here, uh, who is, uh, uh, you know, the lead in the, the Lagos State University uh, Center for Environmental and Sustainable Development, you now have in this presentation a huge resource from where many of your students can draw projects for their postgraduate diploma in environmental education or environmental management, uh, draw uh, topics for research for their uh, what is it now for masters, uh, all their master project reports, and also for, <laughs> for the PhD. So, Michael Aove, you have a, a very rich resource here. So, let me open the floor for people who want to make comments. We have uh, uh, about seven minutes, you know, for this. <laughs> yes. So, just unmute yourself and uh, take the floor. Yeah, this is Michael Ahove. Yes, you have to talk, Michael. Professor Michael Ahove. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah Bill, I appreciate your, your presentation. It's a five-star five presentation. Yes. Uh, very, very, very detailed. detailed. Uh, I, I want, want to mention the connection, connection between politics or leadership, or leadership in government, government the youth, the youth and, and climate change. change. I have been involved in educating the youth, the younger generation, for about 20 years or 25 years now on the issue of environment and climate change. Uh, recently, I just had a fellowship uh, with the Cornell University in New York on climate change. Okay. Now, the point I want to raise is this. One, the younger generation in developing countries and in Nigeria, they are ready to put in their best and to act in favor of the environment and in particular climate change they are ready and as professor capable has mentioned the inhibitors is a major issue but what i'm trying to do is to keep on building these soldiers from the base the soldiers are the younger generation keep educating them and giving them the vision of what we should be doing as individuals in favor of the environment. What, what I've been doing now is to tell them this is the concept and this is the way we must behave 
and this is what we must do to influence government. So what we are doing, we are trying to build soldiers from beneath, bottom up, until we are able to influence the government. Some of them are going into environmental NGOs and they are building up this same vision to influence the government. And I think that's one of the things we can be doing as environmental educators. Well done, uh, 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 Mike. Yeah. So I do not know whether uh, Bill will want to respond to this. So I take uh, why don't why don't I take a, a few more comments and questions? So maybe you want to respond uh, together to all of them. So the floor is open to others. Uh, yes, uh, Kule. Thank you very much, sir, Professor Bill. Um, in the course of the presentation, two key things are highlighted. The climate change and the global crisis. If I go back with what I've understood, these things are not likely to stop. Like Dr. Hove said now that there has no need for over 25 years. These things are not likely to stop. This part of the world is getting warmer. The Antarctica is getting a bit colder also, a bit warmer as well. Why is it coming very hot? So my question is, with what God has embedded in humanity, adaptability feature, and um, the you know, speciation, so to say, if we worry about the older generation due to the climate change, should we worry about the younger ones that will be coming from 2050 and above? Thank you, sir. All right. Let, let, let's take two more. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Ah, okay. yes, yes, sir. That's our granddad. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Take the floor, sir. Um, I, I, I wish to add on to the earlier comments to thank Bill for his wonderful lecture. You know, we in health are pains to get people to understand that the greatest resource on earth is health. And that where health fails, everything else fails. I was glad with Bill's lecture because he was able to connect the issues, the various issues that are occurring on it with economics and also with health and show and if we don't do what is appropriate, eventually the ecology, the environment will overpower us, our health will fail. I'm very glad that Bill is advocating that this should be inculcated into SEM teachers. So that a new, a new, a new, a new class of newer generation of young men and women will get up and teach these things, and hopefully, people will understand where we should be going. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor. Thank you. Who else is taking the floor? The last one, the last uh, person to take the floor. You uh, or me to microphone and uh, fire off. Okay, nobody now. So let me ask uh, Bill to respond to uh, the four interventions. Over to you, Bill. Well, thank you for the comments. And uh, actually, I, I view them more as, as, as comments and directives for action as opposed to maybe a personal response from me because I would be in complete agreement with everything that's been said by each of you. I think that there's ways in which we can look at the past 50 years or so and say to ourselves, there are corrective actions that as a planet, we need to be embarking on. And I like the fact that you mentioned that the youth are in fact driving much of the discourse presently with respect to climate change. So we are at a point, and so you'll notice that the, uh, in my response to the 11,000 scientists, I began with that point. So the title of that article that's appearing at the end of this month is that youth are demanding action regarding climate change. Will educators have the wisdom and courage to respond? So I'm basically asserting that the youth presently on the planet are assuming leadership. And ultimately the issue is, is the education establishment going to respond to that leadership and need? 
or are we going to sit back and fail to respond? That's, I think, the point that we're at right now. And so there's a couple of sources in the paper that I'll bring to your attention. There's a co-authored team, uh, Vandenberg and Gilligan, who actually talk about the entire issue of the failure of people in general, of waiting for governments to respond. And so they talk about the ways in which NGOs and private public partnerships can take place. And that when these kinds of initiatives launch, that we see action that addresses the very issues that many youth are talking about today. I also have a section in the paper that refers to recent social movements and the entire issue of student activism. And I cite some examples of not only individuals who are engaged in student activism, but individuals who, uh, one person in particular who works with local communities in the state of California in the U.S., but addressing the kinds of inequalities that we're talking about from a social justice perspective and ensuring that local communities have movements to begin to take action upon the ways in which the economic structure in the past has infringed upon their lives. And to the last point, by infringing upon their lives, we're talking about infringing upon the health of residents within those communities. So I think the time has come for us to begin to look at the ways in which we can restructure education. There isn't any longer the need for students to be going to school in the year 2020, the way that students used to go to school in the year even 1980. And, and so that's our challenge, is how do we begin to build a cohesive response to each of us working together and collaborating to restructure from the perspective of what it is that people need in the future as opposed to education continually being a study of what took place in the past. And that, I think, is our challenge. Thank you so very much, uh, Bill. Uh, you have given us a lot of food for thought. And uh, I'd like to thank you on behalf of uh, all the uh, participants and facilitators uh, for finding time, you know, as early as you have done to interact with us and to give us such a very rich dose of, uh, of uh, food for thought. We uh, deeply appreciate you, Bill. Uh, by way of announcement before we finally close, uh, today marks the end of our series of lectures for this week. So we are free more or less until next week, Monday. But we are not really, really free because you have a discussion forum to participate in uh, on Thursday. That is tomorrow, but that's at your at your convenience. And then on Friday, also at your convenience to participate in the quiz. And then have a nice Easter weekend, and uh, we're going to see you next week, Monday. I'd like to, again, let me uh, go through uh, you all. We have uh, uh, quite a number of people in class today. Professor Ochen and Zewi, we can see you there. Uh, Mommy, Ms. Olana Waju John, uh, Professor Mostono, who just finished presenting. And uh, Professor Juma Shabani, we can't wait to hear your presentation one of these days. Uh, Professor uh, Michael Faborode, and uh, Japheth Mwene, uh, Henry Dizer, uh, Dan Guimana. Uh, I'm just scrolling through very quickly to Kumbodeke Nuruddin Adijimi, Professor Abayomari Babwa from Ghana, President uh, Fred Awa, Mani Rambuna, my very good friend in uh, Burundi, uh, let's see, uh, Professor uh, Rashid Sani, uh, Cecilia, uh, Cecilia, your, your, your video is not on, you have it on, Ibe Mercy, and uh, all the others. Uh, we will, like all of us, I'm going to unmute everybody, 
where I'm meeting everybody is for us.